I'm writing this more to convince myself that I'm insane than crying for help. The stuff that happens makes no sense to me. Right now, nothing does. Honestly, if I'm not having a psychotic episode, I'm begging you to kill me. I don't want to live in a world where things like this are possible. Where that... Demon, I'll call it, exists. Please hear me out and tell me I'm crazy. For my sake. This year for spring break, my roommate Mitch and I stayed at my grandparents' beach house in Fort Lauderdale. We partied like there was no tomorrow, until a major storm system moved in and shut down the beach. Bored to death, we started to rummage around in the attic. The only thing of interest that we found was Grandpa's old record player and a box of vinyl records from the 70s. Still no luck. They were all old country and gospel albums the last thing two dedicated atheist metalheads wanted to hear. One stood out from the rest, an album in an unmarked paper sleeve. The label on the record itself read, Hezekiah's Herod's Tent Revival. I looked at Mitch mischievously. It's gotta be good for a laugh, I told him. We cracked some beers and started the record. Some static crackled. Then a voice croaked out in a comedically thick southern drawl. I say, brother, this is the hour of repentance. Are y'all ready to return to the Lord? Loud cries of Amen echoed back, and a feisty violin began to grind out old gospel classics. Nothing I hadn't learned to hate in the last 21 years of my grandparents playing it non-stop every visit. We groaned and chuckled a bit at the redneck voice that powered through How Great Thou Art, badly out of key. And they say rock is the devil's music, I joked. Just don't play it backwards, Mitch replied. I couldn't resist. I flipped the switch and reversed the turntable. There was a screech as the needle stopped, then a moan as the record restarted. For a second, we could only hear distorted violin music. Then slowly, a sound built. The same southern drawl filled the air, but with a sinister hiss. Brothers, we are called today to this solemn conclave to begin anew, to consecrate our souls to a higher power, to become children of the kingdom, the kingdom of the grave. Mitch and I both put down our beers. We have come to consecrate our souls in innocent blood. We have come to call on the name of our true Lord and Master. Speak his magnificent name. Thumazak. Thumazak. The audience chanted in response. The wind outside picked up sharply and the rafters began to creak around us, wide-eyed. We continued to listen. Praise be to the Lord of maggots, to him who strips our sinful flesh from our bones and makes us in the very image of death. His words were met with cries of glory and amen from the audience. Bring forth the child. The leader continued to the sound of a knife being unsheathed, as weak, feminine screams echoed from the record player. The horrific sound was silenced by the sickening squelch of a blade biting into flesh. Mitch looked at me in disgust. We liked shock rock as much as the next guy, but this sounded like an actual murder being recorded. It was the most vile thing I'd ever heard, but I couldn't stop listening. Take. Drink. This is our blood. Shed to draw our Lord near unto us. Thumazak! Thumazak! The chant grew louder. There was a sickening, wet tearing sound, and a groan of agony from the record before the leader resumed. Take. Eat. 
This is our flesh, that we may be free of it and fit for the grave. The chants grew ecstatic and incomprehensible as they began raving madly in tongues. The winds outside were so powerful now, and the whole house shook. I looked to Mitch, and any revulsion he had expressed turned into outright fear. The leader let out an unearthly groan above the mad babbling, and the clumsy southern drawl dropped into a guttural growl. Go forth unto every nation, tribe, and tongue, decrying misery and woe. Teach them the ways of suffering for my namesake. Proclaim the kingdom of the grave to all flesh that I may feast upon them and be filled. So saith the Lord of Maggots. The attic window burst open from the wind, which knocked over the record player and smashed the record. Mitch and I pushed against the rush of rain to close it as best we could and shoved the heaviest box we could against it. What was that? I panted, catching my breath, which I hadn't realized I'd been holding. It was nothing, Mitch replied without looking at me, and headed down the stairs. Just the wind. We flew home the next day without saying a word about what had happened. On the plane, Mitch seemed too quiet for a guy with some awesome party stories. He just stared out the window and scratched his arm absentmindedly. When the time came for the in-flight meal, I, who am a vegan, was disappointed to see a badly undercooked pork chop on the tray. Mitch, on the other hand, seemed relieved and relished every bite of it, carefully sucking out the bloody drippings off both pork chops. I didn't even ask. I just put my earbuds in and tried to sleep until we landed, eager to put this trip behind us. Back on campus, life continued much like always for about three days. Late one afternoon though, I came back from class to smell a gut-wrenching stench filling our dorm room. It seemed to come from the fridge. I opened it up to see a half-eaten sub sandwich covered in mold and maggots. Ah, oh, Mitch! I yelled and covered my nose. How long has this sandwich been in here? The chicken teriyaki? He replied, looking out from the bathroom. It's left over from last night. Why? I didn't believe him until I saw the wrapper with an order number and date from the day before. I quickly bagged it up and headed for the door. I'll treat you tonight, Mitch, okay? I asked on the way out. I didn't hear his reply. Mitch seemed to be muttering under his breath. Over the next week, Mitch's behavior became increasingly odd. He stopped eating at home and began leaving at unusual hours of the night. The itching on his arm became almost constant, and even when I offered him anti-itch ointment, he refused. He wouldn't tell me where he'd been either. Once when I asked, he said that he had been donating blood but I knew he had donated just before we left and he couldn't give blood twice in less than four weeks at our local blood bank. I didn't know why he would suddenly lie to me, but I didn't push the matter. Theft started happening around the dorms, mostly small items at first, but then a special needs student had their emotional support animal, a gray cat named Mr. Irving, go missing. We all helped hang up flyers but after a week, no trace was found of him. That didn't mean much to me at the moment. Until one night. I was woken up by my phone's message tone. There was an Amber Alert in our area for a five-year-old girl who was reported missing. That depressed me badly. Always does. Before I could share the alert on my social media, I heard a bone-chilling sound. The babbling chant from the gospel record sounded faintly in the apartment. I looked around and found Mitch talking in his sleep, speaking in a sinister language. Suddenly, I could understand two words. Thumazak. Thumazak. 
I tried to put it behind me the next day. I tried to focus on anything else. I decided to invite Mitch to a movie. Something to clear our heads. I called him, but his voicemail was full. I decided to go back to our dorm room and ask him in person. When I got there, the stench of decay was unbearable. Like a slaughterhouse in the spring heat. I walked in with my shirt pulled over my nose and saw his phone on the table, unlocked. In anger, I checked the voicemails. I wish I hadn't. Hi, this is Linda from Mercy Medical Services. We need to clear up a few things with you regarding your no trespass order. Is this Mitch? It's Al at Midtown Storage. Look, I don't know what you got in your unit, but it stinks so bad. This is Detective Peterson with the 32nd Precinct. I have a few questions to ask. On and on for 17 messages. Now I was furious with Mitch. I burst into his room without knocking, and was met with the most nightmarish sight imaginable. Mitch was sitting in his underwear on a strange symbol written in a mix of chalk lipstick and rotten eggs. His body was covered in open sores that writhed with maggots. He was surrounded by empty IV bags that once held blood donations. Truffs of bloody cat hair covered the room, but worst of all, a human arm, that of a young girl covered in bite marks, stuck out from under his bed. I couldn't even scream. Mitch made eye contact with me, then tore a chunk of maggoty flesh out of his arm and held it up to me. Take. Eat. He said in a guttural growl. This is our... I snapped and ran for the kitchen as he stood up. I don't recall what happened next, though. The police say I had stabbed Mitch about 64 times when they pulled me off of him. So far, I failed about two tests to see if I could stand trial. I don't want to believe this is happening. But if it is... I beg you to kill me. Not because of what I've seen, or what I believe I've done, but because my arm is beginning to itch.